Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sally Guy, and I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Today, I have the honor of welcoming you to the second webinar in a three-part series, which explores some of the results of the Canadian Center on Substance Abuses study, which is titled Youth Perceptions on Cannabis. So for today's webinar, which is titled Effective Youth Engagement to Enhance Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery, this one is a collaboration between the CCSA and CSW in celebration of National Social Work Month. Today, we have hundreds of social workers tuning in from across Canada, and we are so fortunate to have Katie Fleming, a knowledge broker at CCSA, and Daniel Lacombe, a rehabilitation counselor with the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, presenting for us. Most importantly, however, we will also have the great privilege of hearing from a youth with lived experience of the topic that we're exploring, to whom Katie will give a proper introduction in just one moment. So before we get started, just some quick housekeeping items. The speakers are gonna take about 45 minutes, which will be followed by a 15 minute question and answer period that I will be moderating. As a quick note on privacy, um, only the presentation team can actually see your name and your question, so do feel free to type those in throughout the presentation. Uh, as a quick reminder, the recording and PowerPoint of this presentation will also be up on CSW's website just a few hours probably after the presentation. And uh, with that said, it is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Katie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Sally, for, for having us again. Uh, as Sally mentioned, uh, we are very fortunate today to have uh, Shlomo with us. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Shlomo back in November, and I was quite moved by his story. It was very similar to what we had heard through our focus groups when we traveled across Canada, and I thought that this would be a great opportunity to be able to provide some experience with an individual with lived experience. So I was very inspired by the wonderful support that Shlomo received in the community here in Ottawa, and I asked him if he would be willing to share his story with us today. So Shlomo is going to speak about his experience and give you guys an idea of what worked for him from a youth perspective with regards to seeking out help for cannabis use disorder. So I will now turn it over to Shlomo. Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone and welcome. My name is uh, Shlomo. Uh, the first slide says uh, an introduction, a little bit about myself. Um, at age 19, home life was a difficult situation for me and uh, it came time for me to leave home. However, I think the skills that are needed for independent living I really didn't have yet. You know, whether that's showering, hygiene, eating, uh, you know, taking proper medications and whatnot. Uh, all, all these things, I wasn't really ready there quite yet. and. Uh, I ended up actually first going to a friend's garage where I, I stayed out for, you know, maybe about a month, eventually stayed at a couple of friends and ended up in the Young Men's Emergency Shelter, which is a local homeless shelter in Ottawa. Uh, throughout the last, I guess, two to three years, I went uh, into uh, transitional housing, uh, semi-independent living. Uh, I got clean and sober, relapsed, lost the housing. Uh, and then eventually got housing again, uh, went, uh, so sorry, housing again, went to rehab, got a job, and live a very fulfilling, fulfilling life. Sorry, guys, I'm winging this, so just bear with me here. Uh, and I guess throughout my presentation, I'm going to be going through some of those events and how this whole journey has led me to where I am today. And uh, reason for sharing my story is, yeah, to help inform your practices and, and to help others who may be struggling with similar issues. I find it's, it's very important to me that if I have a piece of information that can help others that, you know, I, yeah. So how did you know you were suffering from cannabis use disorder? And uh, so this is uh, really, this is really interesting because it goes back to really early in my childhood. My uh, grandfather, my father's father, uh, committed suicide. Uh, he was an alcoholic and eventually, yeah, committed suicide. And so, and both my mother and father struggle with addiction. So addiction was very well understood and talked about uh, in my family and even within my community from a very young age. Uh, 
I uh, I was I was raised very uh, religious and uh, Jewish Orthodox Jewish, and uh, a lot of the Jewish festivals uh, after the age of 13, which is bar mitzvah, involve drinking alcohol. I remember at 13 years old realizing I like alcohol, and I understood back then that if I drink because in order to cope or because I like it, I will then be an alcoholic and I won't be able to drink anymore. I realized that I had to only drink during Jewish festivals because otherwise I would lose it completely. And I did for many, many years. So I guess, I guess this piece, as I'm trying to say, is that I – sorry, give me one second – is that I understood what addiction was and about my relationship with addiction from a very young age. Struggled with the idea that pot addiction is real. And, and this is really interesting, something that I, I struggled with for a long time. And back when I began to use, I first started using marijuana or cannabis to cope. I had left home, I was living in a garage, I wasn't taking my prescribed medications, and I experienced very real emotional pain, anxiety. And I said, I'm going to go buy cannabis to feel better. I never used with friends. I never, I used alone only. And it was really just pure self-medicating. And so I think I understood from the very beginning that it was really a coping mechanism and self-medicating. So we're going to the next slide here. And is, is how did I know that I was suffering from CUD. So this uh, was still back in the garage is that a, a guy from Narcotics Anonymous came into class to give a school presentation about his experience with addiction and NA. And he uh, spoke about he had a, a thing, uh, an addiction to cocaine, which he was then clean and sober for many years. And at the end, he said, uh, look, I'm going to leave my phone number on the board, and uh, if any of you guys want to give me a call, call me. He said, I'll have them leave it here till the end of the day. And, you know, sure enough, while I was going through this, I wrote down the phone number and, um, you know, kept it with me. And later that night, I called him, and uh, he said, do you want to go to an NA meeting, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting? And I said, yeah. And I, I guess when I got there, they have a list of, you know, symptoms of addiction or, you know, like things to realize that you are an addict and I was reading this and I was like wow you know I really connect with a lot of these and so it was very well understood to me from the very beginning that exactly I guess what my relationship with cannabis was and and yeah how how I knew I was suffering from CUD next slide all right so uh, stages of community involvement. After I got to the young men's, uh, I had enrolled into a youth achievement center at an organization called Operation Come Home. They have a high school program where you can basically go at your own pace. You do your own courses and do your own thing. Now, I had been using and had stopped pot marijuana cannabis, <laughs> sorry, to cope, and then uh, had, had managed to stop using it. So I was um, now attending school there. I was doing my own courses at my own paces. Uh, a month after getting into the shelter, I got into semi-independent living or transitional living where I had an apartment. I had my own bathroom, my own kitchen, but there were staff on the downstairs floor 24 hours a day to access for support. Um, I was doing great, you know. Um, I eventually uh, – I was with the uh, school. I graduated high school, and uh, they also put me in touch with some mental health counseling, this organization, Operation Come Home, and uh, I was well supported throughout the community. I was also going to the Operation Come Home drop-in, as well as another uh, youth services bureau, which is another organization drop-in, and I was also, so I guess, I guess all this to say is that I was very well supported throughout all of this, and I think what was really interesting, I just need to see the next slide. Um, I think what was really interesting about all of this is that later on in that journey, so, I mean, you're kind of getting a chronological sense is that I was in the shelter, I was in transitional housing, and then I, I graduated high school. I went to Algonquin College to take a business marketing course. Um, I, I'm very good at sales and outgoingness, I guess. 
And um, in Algonquin, I stopped attending classes. I stopped taking my medications. I stopped... Um, I stopped uh, showering, I stopped doing laundry, uh, all of these things. And eventually I started smoking cannabis again to cope. And eventually after that, I started drinking to cope. And, uh, and things, uh, I guess, got real bad real fast. Uh, eventually I lost the housing and had to go back to the emergency shelter to stay. And I was still connected with all these services. So I was still going to the... Uh, OCH drop-in or the YSB drop-in, seeing the housing counselor at YSB, still seeing my mental health support at Operation Come Home. And and this community involvement throughout the journey, I guess through the positives when I was clean and doing amazing, and, you know, through these extreme lows, the community involvement remained throughout. And I think that was a very big part uh, of my success and really helped me a lot. Um... Sorry, I know you guys can see all these slides. I just need to go back just to see where they're at. Awesome. All right. So a little bit uh, getting more into the story, I eventually got my own place. So I was still using, and I'm still in the shelter, but I'm turning 21 coming March, and I needed to get my own place very fast. Otherwise, I would go to the adult shelter, which is a very different uh, quality of life, I guess I would say. And I was, I was terrified. I was petrified. And I said, look, I, I have to do it together. So I'm just pulling strings and pulling things out of my hat. And uh, I, I managed to, to go to, to sober up one day and go view an apartment, sign a lease, get help with Ontario Disability. Uh, they helped me pay first and last, all with the help of a housing counselor at YSD and got into my first apartment. Um, I was... Uh, yeah, so in this first apartment, I got in there, but I was still using. There were a couple of, I guess, big problems. I was still very much reliant on cannabis. I, I had stopped drinking at this point. I was very much reliant on cannabis in order to cope. I used it as a coping mechanism, and without it, um, I couldn't I couldn't go. I, and uh, in the beginning, you know, I needed less and less, and as it got further, I needed more and more. Um so, sorry, give me one second. So for those of you uh, on the line, I see that we have uh, we do have hundreds of social workers already logged in. Uh, you, um, your sound is is not um, not working. We're just uh, taking a short break. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, sorry, Sally. Um, Shlomo's just a little nervous. It's the first time he's uh, he's done a webinar, so we just needed to review a slide and, and get back on track here. So if it's okay, we'll we'll continue. Oh, completely, yeah, and we so appreciate you, Shlomo, taking the time to share your story with us. So, yeah, go ahead, your own time, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, please don't mind the slides. I'm just going to go through them just so I can take a look at them. I guess we're going to say, long story short, um, I eventually, having used things, started to get worse, and um, the situation was getting very bad. Now, I needed pot to cope. And this is, I guess, where that struggling with addiction came so difficult, because I would do anything and anything to get it. So, you know, in the beginning, I would start shoplifting uh, from a store, say a pair of headphones, and I'd bring it to a pawn shop, and I'd get nothing for it. I'd get 20 bucks, but I'd take it, I'd go down, down, and I'd buy a gram of cannabis. And the next day, I would do the same thing. Um, eventually, you know, some stores weren't an option to steal from because they recognized me, and I started breaking into the community synagogue. I broke into the family of, of people close to me. My parents wouldn't trust me anymore or my siblings with money because they knew I would just lie to them uh, in order to get money. 
And it was just, it was, it was all taken to such a next level because I was self-medicating with cannabis. I needed it. I couldn't go without it. And, and I was very well aware of the consequences because, oh, that's so funny. We have right here on the slide. I was very aware of the consequences. I mean, I was just, I hated every minute of it all. And yet I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. I couldn't not, not do whatever I could in order to go get some pot. So this, this is, this is, I guess, honest, this inherent paradox. Not eating, I wasn't eating. Trust was broken. And so at this point, I started going in and out of uh, the Ottawa Withdrawal Management Center. I would, I would, I would say, I want to stop, I want to stop using cannabis to cope. Let me try to detox and get off it. I'd go in for four days. I'd come out. I'd go in for four days. I'd come out. And uh, one of these days, they said, Shlomo, do you want to apply for Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center? And I said yes. And, you know, the concept of it was, was very difficult because you hear waiting lists and you say, I don't want to wait. It's so far ahead. It's so, it's so not real. It's not tangible. You don't even want it. But I said, eh, forget it. You know, there's, it's worth it. Nothing hurts to get on the list. And I think this is where the wheels really started to get rolling is when they put Katie in touch with me to go to Dave Smith. I'm back on track, guys. I'm feeling good again. <laughs> So uh, I applied to Dave Smith Youth Treatment Center in um, the summer. So the wait lists were short, and they said, look, it'll be three weeks to a month. And now I had a goal, stay out of jail, stay out of the hospital for, for, for three weeks or a month, just get to rehab. And I did, and I managed not to, to burn any bridges or, or, you know, hurt myself too bad, um, before getting into Dave Smith, and eventually I got there, and there was a big challenge. Let me just see the slide here. There was a, a big challenge, yes. So one of them was that I needed money for recreational activities. Another one is that it was a non-smoking facility, and if there are any smokers on the line, hearing that you're not going to be able to smoke cigarettes for three months while you're learning to cope without cannabis, being away from home, is definitely a challenging uh, criteria. And uh, so I went to Dave Smith, and uh, sure enough, within the first week, I was like, I've had it. I went, I found a cigarette butt, and I smoked it. They gave me a second chance. They said, Shlomo, we see you want treatment. Let's, let's give you another chance. And sure enough, second chance, I uh, went and found a cigarette off someone and uh, smoked it. They suspended me. They sent me home for five days. They said, Shlomo, go home and think if you really want to be in treatment. And I came back, and I still, a third time, went and had a cigarette. And they said, Shlomo, it's clear to us that you don't want to take this treatment seriously. We're sorry you're being discharged from the program. And that was a very, very crappy night because, as it says, you could see uh, on the bottom, it says it gave me a taste of sobriety. In Dave Smith, I had three delicious big meals in a day. I went to bed at a relatively normal time and woke up at a relatively normal time. I was seeing a counselor uh, twice a week. I was going to if you, mental health slash self-improvement groups, twice groups rather, twice a day. I was doing sports activities. I was in school. I was reading the paper because I'd already graduated. But I was still, you know, doing the school hours. And, uh, you know, I was just with a bunch of peers who were also going through the same, the same thing. And, and here I was. I had it all. And I lost it all because I wanted to smoke. And that, that was a really crappy night. And it was that night that I said, okay, I want this. I want sobriety. I want rehab. I want to get out of this mess. Um... And I set my sights on it. I said, I'm going to go to rehab and I'm going to complete it. And sure enough, I did. So I had to wait three months before I could go back. Um, and I got, like, as soon as I could, I got on the waiting list and I waited three months and I stayed out of trouble. And through this, I was still adamantly using stealing. So I was risking my freedom. I was risking, you know, so much. I remember one time I needed cannabis, so I stole a bottle uh, of alcohol from the LCBO, which is the liquor store in Ontario, and uh, I went downtown to sell it 
for marijuana and you know five big guys said why don't you come to this dark alley and we'll we'll pay you so with the money i could buy cannabis and i said well you know they might rob me but i'm willing to take the risk because i really want the money and so the five guys beat the crap out of me i went to the hospital in an ambulance and uh, you know they they stitched me back up and the very next day i did the exact same thing and went back to the buy word market because i needed it and that's and that gets back to the other slide which i'm clicking here i'm winging this as i told you before is that here we go the inherent paradox it's here i am it's clear as day to me you know i mean it's so obvious you i could give a 10 minute presentation on why i should stop using cannabis and yet i still used cannabis eventually i went back to dave smith and i once i got there there were a lot of challenges but none of the challenges overweighed the negative feeling of being discharged, of leaving. And it's funny because a counselor said to me, she said, there's value in relapse. And I said, like, you know, wow, like this, this relapse, this being discharged was actually crucial to my success in Dave Smith. I built confidence. I built healthy relationships. And I learned alternative coping mechanisms because that's what my use of cannabis was. I experienced trauma. I experienced anxiety, all these things, and I didn't want to feel it. So I would get high. And, you know, it's one thing to take the drug away, but you're still left with all these emotions. You're still left with all these feelings. And, and how do you cope with that? And I learned that writing in a journal, going for a walk, calling a friend, and there were a thousand, you guys all took them in school, you know, ways to, to do healthy coping. Um, after three months of, of intense treatment, I uh, came out and I, and I had the confidence. I remember, you know, for years I said, I could never get a real job. Well, February 23rd marked uh, a year at Tim Hortons. I got a job at Tim Hortons, which is amazing. Free coffee every day. Mm -hmm. um, I, got, I got started. I uh, joined uh, the YMCA and started playing badminton there. I uh, started uh, going to a meetup group where they play board games. I removed myself from triggering situations. I stayed out of the downtown core for six months because I knew it was a triggering place for me. And lastly is speaking with counselors and psychiatrists. I don't have time to go through all of it. And that is, uh, I, I, to this day, you know, here I've been clean and sober for over a year. You know, I have a job that I go to every day. My apartment's great. I'm great. And I still see two counselors a week, and I go to a group once a week, and I meet with a psychiatrist once every two months. And this is because it's very important to maintenance. I see my counselors when I'm good and I see them when I'm bad and I keep doing it because I know what an important part that it plays in my recovery to see them while I'm doing well. Um, suggestions for conversations, yeah. Um, how to create a trustworthy relationship. So I guess something, you know, I didn't get it, thank you. Uh, I didn't get a chance to touch on as much was my relationship with a uh, counselor at Operation Come Home. Her name is Katie. Uh, we'll call her Katie. It is. Um, and uh, she was amazing. So how to create a trustworthy relationship. When I had first come uh, to, from, you know, home living to the streets, I was very um, not trusting. And I think that's reasonable. And, um, Creating a trustworthy relationship is not sharing information. So I had someone who was very close to me uh, who was experiencing uh, suicidal ideation. And, you know, I and, – and this person was leaning on me for a lot of support, and that was very scary for me. But I was also scared to talk to my counselor about it because I knew that she would have to inform it. She said, Shlomo, I only have to if there's an immediate danger, and she listed the whole criteria. And so I experimented. I gave her, you know, I would speak to her a little bit about something, and I would see what happened. And that not sharing information, to see that I could trust her was a big uh, piece. Uh, safe space for me, support from staff, no judgment, and we're not disappointed when I relapse. And this is a really interesting piece. Uh, which is so and so, so, so important. And this comes back to my earlier story. When I had first come downtown, I had uh, been using cannabis to cope. I had 
stopped using cannabis. I had gotten semi-independent living. I had completed my high school and started college. So I think I think this would be uh, a place where the social workers, my counselors at the time, would be very proud of me and would all be like, hey, Shlomo, you're doing great. We love that you're doing all this. And they didn't do that. They said, you know, that's really great. I, I, in a positive and supporting way, of course, but, you know, and 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 that's just it, is that when I came, when I relapsed, when I came down from all those things, they were there just as much. They didn't treat me any differently. They weren't disappointed. And, and that was so crucial because if they were, I would have been so afraid to go back and get that help, that support that helped me to get to where I am today. Staff met me where I was at, willing to just listen. And, you know, uh, my counselor Katie always says, uh, you know, I'll meet you where you're at. I remember a good trust building in the beginning. She said, uh, you know, Shlomo, I'm here for whatever you, whatever it is that you need. I said, you're telling me if what I need is silence, you'll sit here in silence? She said, yeah. I said, all right. And I sat there silent, perfectly silent for five minutes. It was unbearable for me. She seemed to be okay with it. But, but that piece really showed me that she was really just there for what I needed. They helped me with smaller struggles in life, which really helped. And finally taught life lessons with experiences. And, and this is, I, I think, a great way. I remember, so, you know, a person who was very much leaning on me for support in an unhealthy way, I was taking that on. And I said, you know, I don't know if I should or shouldn't be. And eventually, I let that relationship, I was said to the person, obviously, this is very vague, but uh, I said to that person, I said, look, you're going to have to deal with your own stuff. I'm going to deal with mine. And Four months later, I'm meeting with Katie, and I, I'd forgotten about this. And I was talking about this person and saying how well they're doing. And Katie said, well, isn't that interesting? You know, you were worried that if you weren't there for them in a healthy way, that they might not be okay. And, you know, you step back, and it turns out that person did okay. And, and, and this is one of hundreds of examples uh, that really teaching me life lessons with experience. There's so much information to share, but I'm really glad – to have been able to share what I can with you today. All the best, and kudos to you guys for helping, you know, people like me go through this because you guys do amazing work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shlomo. That was excellent, and, and I'm sure everyone will agree with me to say that you, what you um, shared with us was very valuable, and, and we'll be able to take those uh, lessons and, and to um, – incorporate them into our day-to-day -day practices. So thank you again. And uh, it's now over to you, uh, Daniel. Uh, I just want to quickly Thanks. also echo here from, from CASW. Thank you so much, Lomo. That was fabulous. Hearing lived experience is so valuable. Uh, and having heard that, that uh, side of the story, we're now going to hear from the, sort of the counselor side, uh, from, from Daniel DeCombe again, who is a rehabilitation counselor with the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, who's, uh, who's going to be taking it from here. Thank you so much. Well, what a tremendous story, and uh, thank you, Shlomo, so much for bringing that to us. And congratulations for one year at your job at Tim's. Uh, that's fantastic. I'm hoping that maybe you can put in a word for us on the roll up the rim issue. I keep getting the please play again when I roll it up, but I'm sure you can help us all out with that. But you did show a lot of courage and insights, and it's just infinitely valuable to have those insights available to us as professionals. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, talking to youth, working with youth. You, you guys here, you social workers are all already experts at this. You are professionals. You know what you're doing. Today, what I'm going to be doing is revisiting some of these basics with you, but in the context of talking to youth about cannabis. Now, I have three goals for the presentation today. Uh, the first is to understand why communication about cannabis has broken down. Uh, the second is to understand how to build rapport with youth. And the third is how to understand, how to communicate key messages about cannabis. The question I often get from other professionals is why don't youth trust us about cannabis? Now, if we were all in the room together, uh, I would be asking you what you think 
the reason is and, and why you believe people are not paying attention to us when we talk to them, especially young people. Um, but there's a very good reason why young people are not paying attention to us. And it kind of uh, looks a bit like this. This is just some of the ways that society used to present cannabis use. And these are all advertisements from quite a while ago, but that they still inform public perception. And you look at some of these old campaigns, and youth are aware of these old campaigns. Some of us are probably old enough to remember seeing some of them, the film Reefer Madness uh, and uh, some of the other myths that were perpetuated by these advertising campaigns. Youth are aware of these old campaigns. If you take a look at online pro-cannabis forums, they mock these on the regular. And why wouldn't they? Look at some of this stuff. Um, so it says like weird orgies, wild parties. Youth just look at this and think, hey, sign me up. This sounds great. Um, it's so corny. And, uh, it, and a lot of it is inaccurate and not just adds to the public misperception. There, it's ineffective and fear-based prevention work. And we don't do fear-based prevention anymore. At the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, we uh, operate on a different model, which uh, looks more towards harm reduction and looks towards leaving behind that fear-based prevention work. When I was back in high school, I recall uh, our prevention work looking like we had a drug activist come in once a year to yell at us about drugs and show us uh, slides of people who had died during drug overdoses and tell us that if we smoked pot, it was going to it was going to kill us. Now, um, that's not how we do things anymore, not least of which is because some of the information is inaccurate. So youth have heard messages from us about cannabis for a very long time. Uh, and what a lot of this comes down to for communication is the myths. Uh, myths are pains that we hold uh, which are not based on fact. They can be positive or negative. Uh, the messages that we've been broadcasting on cannabis have uh, historically been based on inaccurate or bad science, which has caused pro-pot propaganda to flood the internet with information, and some of their information is accurate and some of it is not. There have been several uh, negative myths about cannabis that have been disproven. These, are, uh, these would have been common knowledge uh, or commonly accepted by people who are in the prevention or addictions field in history. Uh, one is that pot causes brain damage or causes uh, brain cell death. And this is one that I hear from parents quite commonly as I work with parents who are uh, having young people who are expressing cannabis use disorder. Uh, pot, pot does not actually cause brain damage or brain cell death. This is something that was uh, perpetuated by a study in 1974 that has been since disproven. There's also the myth of pot overdoses. Now, you, there's no amount that a human being can reasonably smoke that's going to result in an overdose. The third is that pot as a, as a gateway drug. While some users do go on to harder drugs after using cannabis, it's not happening in, in every case and not in the amounts that I think people used to perceive that it was. There's other factors that are a better predictor of ongoing uh, hard drug use. And even if someone is not using the quote-unquote heavy drugs, as we've heard from Shlomo, the cannabis use disorders can still have severe issues even if they're not resulting in overdose or death. So these myths have made uh, youth very mistrustful of anything that we have to say uh, to, to them when we are doing our prevention work. There are also several positive myths that uh, that uh, that youth are believing about cannabis. The most popular myth is that it's not addictive, and we've just heard from Shlomo and his story how that clearly there's cases where it is. Uh, the second myth is that it's not harmful. Well, again, we've heard from Shlomo, and you, as social workers, you've probably seen it yourself when people are coming to you, when young people are coming to you, and having many issues related to their cannabis use. Uh, the third one, and probably my favorite, is that it's natural and therefore safe. Uh, one young person said to me, it's a, it's a plant, I'm just smoking a salad. And I, you know, I once I stopped laughing, I, I had to really kind of challenge that perception. And the perception that young people have and that our society has, that natural is always better, is unfortunately not always accurate. And we have to sometimes... Uh, challenge these, although very carefully. We heard a lot about these myths in the previous webinar, which you have, if you haven't heard, I'd encourage you to go listen to with the CCSA research. 
all these myths are pretty pervasive and they contribute to the positive youth perceptions of cannabis. And if we're going to be uh, debunking some of these or myth-busting these, that, that's a very risky prospect. Uh, I do occasionally challenge some of these myths uh, with the pot is natural, therefore it's safe one. I'll often point out that there's many, many examples of natural plants that are poisonous or deadly, that uh, nature is nature's out to get you. Okay, it's not, a, it's not always a safe place. And just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's better. We also need to realize that with this, with the myths that are coming, the, the, the negative myths that have been disproved and these positive myths that youth are buying into, uh, there's a lot of mistrust and hostility towards us. I do over 50 high school classroom presentations a year. And about 10 to 20% of them, I'll have at least one youth who shows up ready to throw down with me. They show up armed with statistics, YouTube videos, and research that they don't quite understand, and they are, they're ready to challenge everything I say. They're ready to fight. And I, I can't engage them at that level. I can't engage them in a fight, especially not in front of a classroom, because it's not useful prevention work. The fact remains that we can't, uh, we can't argue our way into having them believe us. We can't argue or direct or force them into compliance. We have to break down the barriers between youth and adults, and we have to build bridges between the two of us. We can't expect them to listen to us without relationship. Uh, we heard from Shlomo how important the relationships he was building with his counselors and with others who were helping him were for his development and his uh, recovery. We also need to recognize that there's only... You know, there's a barrier between us, between us and the youth that we are trying to do prevention work with, and the only key to that barrier is is empathy. Empathy is something that you have all heard about through your training and, and education. It is the single best predictor of a higher success rate in addictions counseling, by far. People who show high levels of empathic skill have young people who are less resistant, more likely to change, more likely to stay in treatment, and less likely to relapse. With empathy, the client opens up more readily, is more open to the gentle challenges about lifestyle issues and beliefs. Uh, clients become more comfortable examining their own ambivalence about change and less defensive. Overall, empathy facilitates change. I've got a quote here now from Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers, who many of you know, was an American psychologist. He's one of the founders of the humanistic approach or client-centered approach to psychology. He is considered one of the founding fathers of psychotherapy, and he's someone that I'm sure you've all read about in your schooling. He says here, being empathic means that for the time being, you lay aside the views and values that you hold for yourself in order to enter another's world without prejudice. And that can be very difficult for us, especially when we are observing a young person who is dealing with a cannabis use disorder and is having tremendous impacts on their life because of it. When there's lots of negative results, when there's lots of harms that they're experiencing, that can be very difficult for us to lay aside our values and not just stampede into their lives and say, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing this to yourself. It's hurting you so much. The way we build empathy is fairly straightforward, and again, this is probably a review for many of you. We need to meet youth where they're at. Shlomo talked a lot about this too. We need to go to their context. We need to. Um, we got good advice from Shlomo on this. We need to go into their context and and understand what their lives are about. We need to also engage honestly with their interests, not just around alcohol and drugs, uh, but around their lives. The the amount of activity that we have with a young person is such a small cross-section of their lives that it can feel a little one-sided. We show up, we talk about the one or two issues we're there to talk about, and then we vanish, and we, we don't get much of the whole person. But if we actually are able to take the time to invest and to figure out who these kids are, what they're interested in, what their lives are about, we can actually be much more effective. We can build that empathy that can be the single best predictor of change. Some of the best therapy I ever did was with a young person who was very hostile towards the concept of addictions counseling and very suspicious because very into music. So we start off every session by watching music videos on YouTube that he would have picked during the week to, to show me. And uh, it was some of the best therapy I ever did. Finally, we need to look at the reasons 
for their actions, including their cannabis use. This piece is crucial. There's many different reasons for using, which you discussed last week and we'll continue to discuss today. Um, and we need to understand why they're doing it, because if we don't understand why they're doing it, then the communication is going to break down. So what that means is, especially for talking about cannabis, is that when we need to be aware that when a youth is using cannabis because of being stressed or depressed or struggling with symptoms of mental illness or feeling the effects of trauma or having a rough day, a lot of the things that Shlomo brought up, when they're using for these reasons, then our own communication with them is going to be flawed. And it's not our faults. Okay, it's not your fault that the message can't get through properly. The problem is that when we are saying to these young people, hey, you need to stop using cannabis, what they hear is, I want you to stop feeling better. And that is a tremendously frightening message for youth. It can block any positive messages that we are trying to send. When what they hear from us or when they hear from their parents that we want them to go back to the way things were before they discovered this this magic bullet that solved all their problems from their perspective, uh, we lose ground. And in order to, to avoid losing ground, we need to fall back on our empathy. We need to understand why they're using cannabis. A great model that I've had uh, success with in the past is looking at William Glasser's five basic needs. Are they using for survival, for love and belonging, for power, for freedom, or for fun? If you're talking to young people who are using just for freedom or fun or power, that you might uh, take a different approach than someone who's using to belong to a social group or someone who's using to survive their experiences of mental illness or of trauma. We also have to communicate that understanding in a way they can receive, especially for youth who use cannabis to relieve stress, mental illness, or trauma. We have to communicate this understanding non-judgmentally and with empathy. We also have to earn the right to be heard. It's going to take time. Okay, We can't waltz into someone's life in first session to start laying down the law. It's, it's going to take some time. It also means that we can have all the fantastic tools and counseling skills in the world. And I'm sure that most of you do. Most of you have lots of amazing tools and you probably wield them very well. And we do that with our clients. We, we come into their lives. We use these fantastic tools. We've been given their evidence base. They're doing all, we're doing all the right things. But that will pale in comparison to the empathic relationship that we can develop with youth. I've got another quote here from Dr. Irvin Yalom, who is one of my favorite authors. He's a psychiatrist. He's a professor of psychiatry at Stanford. He's written many, many books, and, and I love his work. This is a quote uh, from one of his books talking about sessions he was having with a client. And he said, though he had shared the hour, and he's speaking about the hours with uh, his client in, in therapy, we experienced it and remembered it idiosyncratically. For one thing, we valued very different parts of the session. My elegant and brilliant interpretations, she'd never even heard them. Instead, she valued the small personal acts I barely noticed. My complimenting her clothing, her appearance, her writing. My awkward apologies for arriving a couple minutes late. My chuckling at her satire. Being empathic is so much a part of everyday discourse. Popular singers warble platitudes about it, being in each other's skin, walking in the other's moccasins, that we tend to forget the complexity of the process. It is extraordinarily difficult to know really what the other feels. Far too often we project our own feelings onto the other. Now, I love Yalom's work. If you ever get a chance to read his books, The Gift of Therapy is a great place to start. Talking about empathy, we need to recognize that it's that empathic relationship that the youth is going to remember the most. Youth who have been through therapy when they are questioned about you know, what did you get out of it, what were the best parts of therapy for you, they very rarely bring up, oh, well, I really liked how they you know, said this uh, psychological fact or that psychological fact. They'll talk about how they appreciated the care and the relationship. I have a few do's and don'ts here that um, I could just run through really quick. These are just some communication tips, and I'd usually deliver these to parents, but it also works for us who are professionals. Um, we do give them accurate factual information, but we don't moralize cannabis use. We do talk about understanding the benefits some people receive from using alcohol and other drugs, but we, and we don't overlook the reasons why they are attracted to drug use, but we have to address it and talk about alternatives. We do discuss how they can respond in situations when they're feeling pressure or craving to use, but we don't just tell them just say no and leave it at that. And we do allow them to practice critical thinking and come up with reasons for why they want to be drug-free. And we avoid lecturing and going on about all the reasons why we want them to be drug-free. And that's a difficult one for myself as well. 
The key messages that we have for youth, we need to focus on brain development. Just like from the previous webinar, the prefrontal cortex solidifies between 21 and 25 years old. Prior to that, the brain is more vulnerable to negative change. So then we focus on delayed use. If you're going to use, we should make sure you're using as late as possible in your life. And finally, we need to remember that we are not moralizing. We aren't saying cannabis is right or wrong. We aren't saying you can never use cannabis. We are saying it's healthiest and safest to delay use as long as possible. We aren't priests. We're not here to argue right and wrong, especially in the context of the upcoming legalization. We're just trying to reduce the harm of cannabis from the lives of young people. And finally, one last quote from Dr. Robert Lindner, who was a psychologist and uh, wrote extensively on gambling addiction and as well as other issues. He said, counseling is a vital art that demands more of its practitioners than the clever exercise of their brains. Into its practice also goes the heart. And there are occasions when genuine human feelings take precedence or the rituals and dogmas of the craft. So I encourage us all to recall that and remember that empathy and those empathic relationships are the single best predictor of change when we're working with young people with alcohol and drug issues. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, uh, for, for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, this does bring us to the question and answer period. I'll just quickly do another little reminder on housekeeping as I've had a few questions throughout um, that yes, the recording of this webinar, as well as the PowerPoint slides, are going to be avail available on the CASW website uh, about an hour after the presentation. Um, again, I would encourage you to keep on typing in those Q&As into the Q&A box on your screen uh, throughout. But with that said, I, I think I'm just going to jump into the, the first one that we have here, um, which is, is directed towards Daniel, I think, but I think that any of our, our speakers, Shlomo or Katie, too, could, uh, could answer it as well. But um, it says, your talk highlighted the importance of the human aspect of counseling. With that in mind, do you think that the relationship, so the relationship in, with the youth, or the information provided or technique is more important when working with youth and cannabis? I would say that the relationship is more important because without the relationship, then none of that other information can be effectively communicated. And uh, there's a great book, a great counseling book called The Heart and Soul of Change. And uh, it talks a lot about, um, it, it talks a lot about how therapy uh, is based primarily on the relationship between the, the counselor and the, the counselee. It's, um, it's a it's a great book if you if you can pick it up I encourage you to because it it's uh, it really highlights some statistical insights into why the relationship is so important and um, at least speaking for myself I've never had success at communicating information about cannabis use or about uh, cannabis use disorder without having a relationship it usually doesn't go very well so I would say that the, the relationship should be the primary focus and the information will sort of naturally follow afterwards. And uh, Shlomo yeah. just wanted to jump in and provide uh, his perspective as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the relationship, I think back to uh, a counselor that I had, we'll call him Greg, and uh, I used to come into his office, I'd sit on the couch and we'd chat and we would just kick... Uh, kick the fun. Uh, you know, he had a guitar that we would play. We would play ping pong that they had in the drop-in. And I don't remember getting very much factual information from him. But yet, you know, when it was coming, you know, while I was, you know, using cannabis, while I was drinking to cope, ultimately a goal of mine was to go uh, still find independent living. And, you know, when he said, you know, what do you think about taking a shower, throwing on some nice clothes and going to his viewing, I, I, that relationship, I guess, really contributed to my trust of that suggestion or that idea saying, wow, you know, maybe I can do this. So I think that the relationship far outweighs simply information. Yeah. Well, that is a, that's, that's a great comment from, from both of you. Um, the next one, uh, this one is directed to, to Daniel specifically, I think. Um, you mentioned a scenario where there was a youth that came to your presentation ready to fight on this topic and that it wasn't the appropriate time to do so. 
uh, I think sh she's wondering, how would you diffuse the situation or would you follow up later with this youth? Well, I would absolutely try to follow up later with the young person, but right then and there in the classroom, and you've got to keep in mind this is in a classroom of you know, 30 to 40 people, and, uh, and most of them are happily ready to watch a, uh, an argument between the presenter and, and one of their friends. Um, the best way to diffuse any conflict, and this works for presentations and prevention, this works for relationships, uh, this works, if you've ever taken any martial arts, they'll, they'll talk to you about this too, is to not take it head on, but to approach it from the side. So what I'll usually start doing is I'll start agreeing with them. And uh, partly because they will start challenging some of those, like I said, those negative myths that say, oh, well, but you can't overdose on pot. And, you know, a lot of grown-ups will lie to you and say that you can't overdose on pot, and I'll agree with them. And I'll even take it one step further. Uh, if they say, well, you know, it doesn't kill brain cells, they'll say, you know, you're absolutely right. And there was a study done in 1974 where they thought that that was the case. But since it's been proven wrong, why do you think that it's still a pervasive myth that people believe? And... When you do that, you're not meeting force with force because they're expecting you to, to butt heads with them and, and approach them head on and just get into a, a, a mud wrestling match with them. And uh, you don't, mess, you don't re wrestle in the mud with someone who's expecting it and, and looking forward to it because it's, it's, it's going to go their way. And uh, we're not trying to fight at all with them. But when you approach them like this and you, you approach it from the side, you really diffuse the tension. You stand beside them and not against them and you can say hey let's talk about this is a complicated issue and, and yeah lots of stuff has been uh, talked about in society for a long time and why do you think that is and maybe we can get to the bottom of it ourselves and then it's no longer a fight and then it's a discussion and they're a lot more willing to hear some of the the actual facts uh, when you approach it like that. And I'm always very careful to say look I'm not I'm not an anti-pot advocate I'm not a activist I'm not here to you know, make you do anything. I'm I'm not here to to moralize. You know, the right and wrong doesn't really concern us in this discussion. We're we're here to talk about the science, and most of them have a very high opinion of science because that's you know that that's what they think they're they're bringing to the discussion. They think they're bringing facts and science. And so, someone who's truly committed to the scientific method is going to be a little more open once you approach them like that. That's usually how I diffuse the situation. I, uh, I just wrote down, don't stand against, stand beside. I thought that was, that was great. Um, I'm, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone in the audience, too, that I will be doing my best to get to all the questions, but uh, thanks for understanding that due to time constraints, we may not get to all of them. With that said, I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions for this next one, uh, which is, um, what advice would you give to someone working at an agency or with an organization that is taking an abstinence-only or a zero-tolerance approach? And sort of related to that would be how can we best um, advocate for children and youth getting the impending legalization of cannabis in Canada? Sort of uh, looking at that through that harm reduction um, lens that you were talking about. Okay, so as far as the absence uh, based question goes, um, a program that's going to be doing that and they have their place. You know, and and AFM has uh, programs where absence based is the is the, is the norm. Like our residential programs are like that. Um, and uh, just kind of speaking as far as that goes in the context of the upcoming legalization, we have we have a lot of people in our society who are having problems with alcohol, and alcohol has been a legal drug for a very very long time. Uh, when we have abstinence-based program, programs and programming, um, I think that the best approach to use with them is to acknowledge that, look, this is, uh, this is something that some people are more able to easily do than others, and it's difficult to... Uh, it's difficult to communicate the message to someone that, look, people, some people are able to drink at a healthy level and, and you don't seem to be able to do that so maybe this is not something that you can uh, readily do um, you're asking of it it's a very it's a very difficult question in the context of uh, harm reduction because harm reduction is it's it's the best practices but it's also controversial 
And uh, as much as it is best practices, it's also not perfect practices because we don't have that yet. So um, you're asking a question that I would dearly like some very good answers to myself uh, as we're, we're doing our best to, to balance that. The program that I work in uh, is harm reduction based. We don't have uh, an absence uh, necessarily focused goal all the time, although most of the people that we work with, that does become an eventual goal if they stick with it long enough. I'm not sure how well that answered the question, but no, no, I, I think it, it definitely did. And I mean, these are these are big, hard questions, so we don't expect really anyone to have the the full answer. Um, this one's actually for Shlomo, not to put you on the spot, but um, the question was: Was there one aspect of your journey to recovery that you found sort of most important above all others? I'm trying to think. Um, I think the most important was the acceptance of relapse, the acceptance of poor choices, and, and yeah, the acceptance of where I'm at. I think that uh, there are scenarios, I'm trying to word this the right way, where that doesn't happen, and I think that that very well could have completely hindered all the progress that I've made, but also could have made because of that. You know, when I, when I, for example, went back to Dave Smith, it wasn't, oh, you got kicked out, let's see what you want now. And that is that really that non judgmental, that acceptance of where we're at, I think was so crucial. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's fabulous. Um, this one actually, I think. Shlomo, you or or Katie or Daniel could, could probably answer, but um, maybe towards Daniel first. Um, in your experience, what is the most common element or factor that you're seeing that pushes youth from casual cannabis use or sort of like okay cannabis use to a cannabis use disorder? Uh, in my context, I would say the most common, well, one of the most common factors, I could break it down to a couple, would be experiencing uh, some of the harms and then starting to run from those harms into further cannabis use. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Someone is having trouble at school because they're, they're under the influence a lot. They, that makes them stressed, and their method of stress reduction is to smoke more pot. And it just kind of feeds into itself until eventually, like, you don't see them at school for two months and you have no idea where they are. Um, but I, I, would, I would bring it back to the previous webinar and talk about uh, the neural pathways and say if someone is, is using for a purpose, if they're using to reduce stress, using to uh, reduce feelings of depression or mental illness, using to uh, deal with feelings of trauma, that's typically what causes those pathways to develop in such a way that... Um, they are more likely to become dependent for dealing with those feelings. And from um, our yeah, perspective, okay. the, re the research that we've done totally echoes everything uh, what Daniel has um, said. One of the most common reasons for youth that we heard uh, among youth was um, that of stress reduction to to escape reality, to deal with um, uh, to deal with depression, and, and those were cannabis use were um, coping mechanisms. So it's pretty much exactly echoing what what Daniel said, and Shlomo shaking his head in agreement as well. Um, Katie, actually, that probably, that goes well into the, the next question, which which is um, in your guys' experience or in the research, what was one of the biggest barriers to recovery? From what we heard uh, through the focus groups and the, the qualitative research that, that we done, it, it was um, those non-judgmental conversations. A lot of youth didn't trust uh, the individuals uh, in, their, in their lives to have those conversations and, and felt you know, shame when, when they would be acknowledging the fact that they needed help or, or trying to reach out and, and then being told, well, you know, it's, a, it's an illegal drug anyways, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing it, or, you know, just stop, like, you can just stop, and, and not recognizing the fact that it is an addiction and, and there is um, a requirement for treatment. So I would say the biggest barrier from the youth perspective that, that we spoke with was having the ability to have those safe conversations um, in a non-judgmental way and, and sort of echoing what Shlomo had said, 
um, about the importance of acceptance of, of relapse. Like if they're on the road to recovery and, and they, you know, hit a speed bump or, or fell off a bit, um, being able to go back and to have those conversations and, and to say, you know, it's okay, like let's see where you're at, reassess and, and try to move forward. That was a, a very common theme that we heard throughout our focus groups. Another I barrier that too, I would see. What Daniel was saying about the importance of, of the relationship being sort of paramount in work with, with youth. Um, this might Another be barrier that I would see would, oh, sorry, if I could just oh, input ahead, there really yeah. quickly. Another barrier would just be that marijuana is a drug that demotivates people, and so much of uh, recovery relies on there being some motivation for someone, so that can be... Uh, another self-perpetuating cycle where it tends to drag the motivation that you need to change down even as you're uh, trying to get more motivation. Yeah, makes it really difficult. Um, I'm, I'm going to make this the last question just because we already are just slightly over an hour, which was our time. Uh, I just think it's an interesting one that uh, the correlation between trauma and cannabis use was, was brought up. And is there any sort of evidence or, or even anecdotally that youth have experienced trauma are more likely to use cannabis than other youth or that they would be more likely to use cannabis than, for instance, alcohol or, or other substances? I mean, Offhand, uh, this is Daniel speaking. Hey, Katie or, or, or Dan, Daniel. And oh, here. sorry, Katie, you go ahead. You probably have uh, more recent information than I do. Well, Basically, what we what we know about um, substance use uh, as a coping mechanism to trauma, it's it's I guess it's very challenging to know like what particular substance is is favorable over others. We know that um, those youth who have experienced trauma um, often are more likely to to use substances. Um, this isn't something that I have specifically looked at uh, from like a qualitative perspective. Um, Daniel would probably be able to provide a little bit more context based on the position that he holds with, within the schools. Typically, uh, when I'm talking to youth, and this is, and this is anecdotal, and I, I would like to have some actual data to, to back this up, but the youth that I'm, I'm seeing, when there's, uh, when there's trauma present, um, marijuana is just so very effective at, uh, at getting rid of those feelings. And, um, and the ones who don't go into heavier drug use but have experienced trauma tend to tend to park with marijuana. But I've also seen a lot of uh, young people gravitate towards the opiates when there's trauma present. And uh, there's a, a host of other reasons for that. That's a that's a whole other ball of wax that one. But um, yeah, I, I would. It's definitely common. But as far as is it more common than other drugs for people who have experienced trauma? I, I would have a hard time pinning that down. I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any recent research on that. That doesn't mean that there isn't, but uh, it's not something that I've recently read. Well, there you go. There's our there's our mandate for the future for, for future research. Um, I, I will be wrapping up there just because we are over an hour. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for tapping in today. Again, I apologize if we weren't able to get to your question specifically. And of course I need to say a huge thank you to Katie and Daniel but especially to Shlomo, it takes a lot to come out and share your story, and it's so valuable, especially to a profession like social work who knows the value of lived experience. Um, I know that we're all looking forward to the next webinar and the last webinar in this series, which is on March 22nd, also at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Another just quick reminder, just because I'm, I'm seeing this question pop up, yeah, the PowerPoint and the recording will be posted on CSW's website shortly. And also for those who need uh, confirmation of attendance, uh, for their continuing education hours. If you attended 45 minutes or more of this presentation, that confirmation can be downloaded by clicking on the yellow icon, which is the rightmost icon at the bottom of the presentation window that you're watching right now. Uh, that'll be available a few hours after the conclusion of the presentation. You can download that by logging back in using the link and email that you're using right now. Uh, you just click there and, and press download. Um, finally, just thanks to everyone in advance for taking a few minutes to complete our short survey. It's going to help inform future continuing education uh, opportunities for you. And, you know, until next time, thank you all again. Thank you to our presenters, and everybody have a great National Social Work Month.